welcome to another episode of Pastors Talk. Today, it's a privilege. I've got Pastor John Hollis with me to talk about our scripture readings from the Northside Weekly. We are following the life of Jesus in the Gospel of John, right. and we're doing that for Holy Week. And so today's passage that I hope you will be able to take a few moments and read if you haven't yet is found in John chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. And there's some really good stuff here, there John. Is. So there really is. I'm um, privileged to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So let's talk about this, John, right, and what's going it. on. Um, this is, uh, in John's gospel, this is taking place right after Palm Sunday. So right, right after Jesus marches into Jerusalem, a city that is probably a buzz with people oh, because yeah. of Passover and everything going on there with that. Um, and we begin with uh, kind of a request that there's some Greeks um, among those who went up to worship at the festival, and uh, they would like to see Jesus, right. is what the, the text says. So, I so was, uh, I had just <clears throat> done a little bit of background reading on the passage, knowing we were going to cover it today, and uh, one of the interpretations of that seeing Jesus was the idea of an interview. Okay. Okay. In other words, more than just hey, we want to more than just look at him. Is. I, you know, it was. We want to ask him a couple of questions, you know, and uh, so anyway, that was interesting to kind of okay. pick up on that. Not that that's the end all of sure. <laughs> what it meant, well, but that was a, a comment made. Yeah, and uh, I think it's kind of interesting then Jesus' reply and, you know, yes. where he goes with, you know, this request yes. to be seen. Um, yeah, it and, didn't seem to answer them at all, other than <laughs> the fact that it was more of a, a general answer of uh, yeah. this is what I'm about. And Jesus seems to do that sometimes. He does. Kind of surprises <laughs> us when he's asked something. He doesn't maybe answer in the ways that we would. But um, he basically says in verse 23, he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Um, just kind of a interesting little you know story parable there. Yeah, that, you're right. That Jesus tells, and I obviously connected to his death. Sure. And what's going to happen? Absolutely. Um, Thought it was interesting that uh, John actually said there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship. Hmm. Uh, yeah, speaking of Gentiles, proselyte, proselytes, maybe uh, that were there on their way to Jerusalem to worship. Here again, some of the background that I had run on to just said that maybe these these weren't actually proselytes who had said we have now become Jews, okay, but were more attending the synagogue for the sake of believing that Christ was uh, worth listening to, mm -hmm. that they were following Him. Uh, but it also speaks of the of the Gentile thing that Jesus was referring to or relating to, and. Uh, uh, I think it comes out later in the passage there too. Mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, anyway, we'll get to that possibly. But but I thought it was interesting that that John actually said there were some Greeks yeah. <laughs> in town. Uh, I was just kind of looking yeah. at the, the message here. Sure. Uh, uh, who had come to worship at the feast? They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? So anyway, uh, just the fact that he, he specified that. Yeah. And maybe Greeks in, in his words were more like in a general sense, those that were non-Jews, hmm. Gentiles. And of course, Greeks would have been, Greek would have been the language that many of them, mm -hmm. Aramaic and that kind yeah. of thing that were used. It was used. And so maybe it was just kind of his lumping them together under the title of the Greeks in, that were in town. Yeah. And maybe just reminds us that, you know, this Passover feast um, festival that was a really big deal that the Jews would do once a year. Right. Um, and they would remember, you know, what God had done. Oh, and, absolutely. You know, letting the people, um, set the people free from Egypt, but also right. look forward to, you know, um, a Messiah. But right. I think that John's telling us there was some diversity of people that were coming to Jerusalem sure. to kind of hear about this and maybe were curious. And then also with... You know, just some of the things that Jesus has done up until, you know, this point in the story. Um, right before, you know, John chapter 12, you know, we have Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure that would have, uh, 
you know, if they had news channels, um, I'm sure that would have been the he uh, headline story. Um, and so then there was a plot to kill Jesus uh, to destroy that continuity. But then also later on, they wanted to kill Lazarus because he was living proof of resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poor, poor guy's got to die again. <laughs> so, so Jesus says something interesting that, um, you know, maybe it's something that John, you've um, had to, maybe a question's come as a result of what Jesus says that you've had to answer. I'm sure you probably preached on this, but in verse 25, he makes a statement, anyone who loves their life will lose it, mm. while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It's kind of a, I don't know, it's just trying to think of, you know, if I've never read the Bible before and I'm reading this and I come across what right. Jesus is saying here, I might be a little confused, you know, about Jesus talking about hating our life right. in order to receive eternal life. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit and, you know, what's what's Jesus trying to say there? I mean, why, why is he saying, you know, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life? How have you kind of dealt with that? Yeah, and it's tied in with the seed thing. Okay, and the dying? In the dying, uh, you know, and I, I'm a gardener and uh, have some farming in my background, not uh, literally uh, owning a farm or sitting on the tractor and tilling the soil in that regard, but been very close to the soil, very close mm -hmm. to the earth uh, throughout my life, actually. But, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that whole thing of God's uh, design of how the seeds would die, mm -hmm in the ground, uh, I think it's here, he says, uh, listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But uh, if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. Mm -hmm. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever real and eternal. I really like the way the message says yeah, that. Yeah, uh, makes... like I said earlier, it's kind of the street language of uh, mm -hmm. maybe I'm a little bit slow to learn, and so it helps me, <laughs> me <too. laughs> I I pick too. up on these things. But yeah, and so the hate thing, uh, I'm sure, was, was Jesus' way of saying, uh, unless you have been willing to give up mm -hmm. the world and anything that separates you from Christ and from serving God, unless you come to that point of total surrender and, uh, yeah. and being buried into the whole thing of, of uh, trusting in Christ, then it's likely that you will yeah. not experience eternal life. Yeah, and I know sometimes just, you know, in some of the other things that Jesus says, he uses hyperbole. Right. You know, kind of this exaggerated speech Absolutely. to make a point. Absolutely. And so... Um, we know from the great commandment, you know, that we're called to, you know, love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it says to love your neighbor as yourself. Sure. So there's not a, to me, it's not a hate yourself, um, but a, like what you were just saying about a willingness to let go, to surrender, sure. you know, who we are in the world and, you know, sons and daughters of the devil and, right. you know, become sons and daughters of the king become sure. sons and daughters of Jesus absolutely so um, yeah and it's also to me uh, something that I, I think is kind of unique to John's gospel his gospel is very unique compared to Matthew Mark yes. Luke and John or right. Matthew uh, Matthew Mark and Luke but uh, he talks about how Jesus there's several times where he says and this is in verse 27 where he talks about Jesus right. being troubled he right. says my soul is troubled and to me it is a great reminder that Jesus is fully human and that he had things that he was trying to deal with that even though it was probably a party festival exciting time in the life of the Jews to be sure. in Jerusalem with all of these people among in Passover that um, for Jesus this was a tough thing because you know he's going into Jerusalem and knowing what's going to happen on Friday for sure that he's going to be crucified and he knows, and it's it's troubled him. It's brought anxiety to him. He, right. He's dealing with that. A uh, comment that I'd run across somewhere, I don't just read a couple of different things, but anyway, was that John didn't deal with the Garden of Gethsemane okay. scene. Mm -hmm. And to him, to this person, was that when Jesus said that about, uh, my heart is troubled, what shall I say? It was that same attitude, that same moment that says, 
Okay, you're right at that point where you could call 10,000 angels. You could say to the Father, I don't think I want to go through this. But he says, my soul is troubled. And yeah. uh, Father, save me from this. I could say, shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came mm -hmm. to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Yeah. And then the voice comes. Yeah. Which Boom. I thought was really interesting because, again, this is unique to John. Right. And in the other Gospels, the voice comes when Jesus is baptized. Yes. There's a voice. Yes. And then uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, right. there's a Three voice. Three times, yeah. Yeah. But here, um, while he's in Jerusalem for Holy Week, yes. there's a voice that yeah. booms and says, um, speaks to him and says, uh, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Right. That's and so John apparently understood the voice, but there was that confusion among the others. It said, well, thunder, what's going yeah. on here? Or <laughs> was that an angel? Uh, and But uh, John and possibly the rest of the disciples heard what was said, possibly for their benefit. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, Jesus yeah, said that the voice was for your yes, benefit. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I, I thought the you know what the voice says. I have glorified it. When Jesus says, you know, glorify yes. your name, the voice says, yes. I have glorified it. I think we could say that's happened just by the way Jesus has lived his life. Sure, he's lived a life that has been all about giving glory to the Father, mm -hmm. um, and then even to the point of death now, because he says he's going to glorify it again, um, and that's going to come as Jesus dies on the cross. Right. Um... where he, he speaks about in verse 30 and 31 there where now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the mm -hmm. prince of this world will be driven out. Um, I forget where I was reading, but anyway, it just said, uh, um, Jesus said, the voice didn't come for me, but for you. At this moment, the world is in crisis. Mm -hmm. Now Satan, the ruler of this world, will be thrown out. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. Uh, and of course, as he put it that way, to show how he was going to be put to death. Yeah. Which, you know, his death is what opens that door for absolutely. You know, Gentiles like us, right? The Greeks, right? To really be taken in and accepted into his family. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, yeah. I he. Down towards kind of the end of this, he talks about how, you know, you're going to have the light just a little while yes, longer. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, that light's going to be taken away, obviously, again, referencing right. his death. Right. Um, and also giving an invitation, though, to become a, a children of light. So, and I, I thought it kind of closes with a really interesting line. Um, it says, uh, when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself yeah, I from them. Too. So, I saw that too. <laughs> I'm trying to think of who. Uh, I, I'm assuming John is referencing the crowd. That Jesus is kind of hiding from the crowd because he's really drawing that attention to, or giving that attention to his disciples. Because uh, chapter 13, we've got him washing the disciples' feet. Yeah, it kind of seems to be. You know, he's kind of gone. He's going away, transitioning from you know speaking and preaching and teaching to a large crowd. To really focusing on the twelve disciples, sure. Um, but just kind of interesting that he hid himself. Yeah. You ever hide yourself as a pastor from people? <laughs> <laughs> you ever want to hide yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, that uh, that brief paragraph there says, uh, uh, Jesus said, "For a brief time, still the light is among you. Walk by the light uh, you have, so darkness doesn't destroy you. If you walk in darkness, you don't know where you're going." As you have the light, believe in the light, then the light will be with you and shining through your lives. You'll be children of light. Mm -hmm. Jesus said all this and then went into hiding. Mm -hmm. All these God signs he had given them and they still didn't get it, mm -hmm. still wouldn't trust him. Yeah. And it goes on and says, then that proved that about what Isaiah said in yeah. the next uh, quote there. Yeah, the quote, from, yeah. Which, yeah, maybe that's. Obviously, you know why Jesus is saying I'm giving my attention now to the twelve. Yes, giving enough to the crowd, and right. you know here's the fruit of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, I think it's a it's it's a great passage for us to really think about. I mean, there's some challenging things in this passage with Jesus being willing to, you know, give up his life. Yes, and this idea of you know of a of a seed being you know planted in the ground dying, but you know through that death there comes life again. 
um, I think it's a great passage for us to think about. So, John, I appreciate having you on here and talking about this. Is there any any closing comments, observations? That... Uh, only the, the, I guess, the thought, and I don't know that I have it actually uh, to where I can speak it uh, directly, but the, the whole Gentile thing, and that, that's mm -hmm. us. Yeah. We're non-Jews, and uh, that we are accepted, and what a privilege that is, and, and to know that that's why uh, Christ was here on earth, but why he was going through all of this, um, going to Jerusalem, yes, knowing that it was the Jewish feast time, but also that this, I'm, it's leading me right to that point of the cross. giving myself up, mm -hmm. and uh, not just for the Jews, but uh, for all who would believe. Hmm. Yeah. Good Amen. stuff. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, John. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, thanks for, for joining us. Yeah. Yep. So a privilege. we'll see you again. Adios. Mm -hmm.